So I just want to thank everybody that's on for coming. Um, this is a seminar series that we are organizing as part of the Analytical Resources Core here at Colorado State University. Um, this is a, a large analytical services group and we're trying to, to highlight some of the technologies and approaches that, uh, that can be enabled through the instrumentation and, and expertise in our facility. Uh, and uh, we are calling on some of our external collaborators and experts to, uh, to bring some of that knowledge to us when we, when we feel that we need some more education in this area. Uh, and with that, I, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Pratik Jagtap. Uh, and when I call him a colleague and a collaborator, I would say that um, he's, been, he's been extremely supportive, um, not only in helping us to learn about metaproteomics and data analysis, but, but actually been involved in helping us uh, in, in supporting our grant that enables us to purchase the instrument that is enabling us to do metaproteomics analysis. So through, through his letters of support, um, we have been able to uh, to, to secure funding to purchase this instrument. So I'm, I'm very excited to have uh, Pratik present to us today. So Pratik received his PhD at the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in India in 2000, uh, during his postdoctoral research in the Schuster Lab at Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in Germany, and then at the Andrews Lab at the University of Michigan. Uh, he worked on genomic and post-genomic analyses of Della Vibrio, an endosymbiont bacterium. Uh, Pratik is currently a research assistant professor at University of Minnesota, and he's a co-lead of the Galaxy P project, which we'll hear about today with Dr. Tim Griffin. And he's involved a lot in development of analytical workflows in the emerging areas of proteomics and multiomics, and in particular, metaproteomics and proteogenomics. As part of this Galaxy P team, uh, over the last decade, he's presented many oral presentations, posters, workshops, national and international conferences. And he's currently the chair of the ABRF Informatics Proteomics Research Group uh, after chairing the Proteomics Research Group from 2018 to 2020. He's also on the executive board of the International Metaproteomics Initiative, which is involved in communicating and advancing metaproteomics research. So with that, I'm going to turn the, uh, the table over to Pratik and, and I look forward to his presentation. Thanks everybody for attending. Thank you very much for your introduction, Corey, and uh, for the invitation to give a talk here. Um, can you see the screen, the first slide here? Yeah, we can. So, yeah. So um, today's talk, uh, I'm going to be talking more about the data that comes out of the instrument uh, and how we can analyze it to get more information than just looking at single organism proteomics that is uh, usually what is used uh, mass spectrometry is used so so uh, the area of research i'm going to talk about today is metaproteomics um, and i'll try to uh, go through the slides and uh, explain to you how uh, we have implemented some analytical workflows into a galaxy platform uh, and how we are disseminating this through uh, various educational resources that are available. Um, as uh, Corey mentioned, uh, my name is Pratik Jagtap. I'm from University of Minnesota. Uh, if you uh, would like to know more information, information about me, there are uh, quite a few links here that you can access. Um, I work with uh, Professor Tim Griffin, who's been shown here, uh, who's part of the Galaxy P team, along with uh, multiple developers, as well as users and data analysts uh, who help us to, um, to make this possible. So uh, the talk is going to be divided into five sections. Uh, I'll start with uh, an introduction to metaproteomics and functional microbiome analysis, uh, and then also talk a little bit about uh, you know, implementing these workflows within Galaxy platform, uh, and then moving on to quantitative metaproteomics, uh, and then looking into uh, one of the project that we are working on uh, right now uh, from a data that has been generated from the FAMES instrument, the same uh, or a similar instrument that uh, you have in your core facility uh, to kind of try to go deeper into uh, the metaproteome of um, clinical samples. And at the last, I'll, I'll talk a little, about, about, li little bit about our efforts in education and promotion of these resources. So going on to the first section, uh, most of you might be aware uh, Microbiome research has taken a lot of, uh, generated a lot of interest in the last few years about uh, not only its uh, presence in the 
human body, but its effect that it has on, uh, on, on the human body or its health, right? So for example, not only is it um, involved in diseases, uh, but it can also affect your, uh, your, your mental health and uh, your normal uh, health and other processes that are taking place in your body. Uh, it has been shown uh, that uh, you know the presence of the right organisms or the metabolites that are uh, generated by these organisms can have a profound effect on uh, various functions of your uh, of your body. So there is you know definitely a lot of interest in gut microbiome, and there have been multiple uh, studies, most of which use metagenomics method, you know, sequencing DNA. Um, however, we think that we can go deeper into this by using uh, mass spectrometry data, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Then there are quite a few other researchers who are also interested in looking at microbiome of various environmental systems. Uh, there is a great interest in looking at the microbiome that's present in soil, how it can affect uh, agricultural produce or even uh, growth of uh, different plants or different uh, uh, plant flora. And then there is, of course, a lot of interest in ocean microbiome and um, uh, and, and you know other other environmental systems. So there's a great interest in trying to understand not only the taxonomic composition, but also trying to understand how these bacteria or how these microorganisms affect uh, the either the health of the individual or the uh, the ecosystem in general. So in general, researchers uh, have used uh, two or three different methods. Uh, the most prominent of, amongst these is metagenomics, wherein you basically start with uh, isolating DNA from the environment or from the, from, from the gut microbiome sample, if, if that's what you're studying. And the focus there is uh, to understand what is the taxonomic composition of these um, of, of that particular environment that you're studying. So, uh, and these methods, uh, bioinformatic methods have been developed and, uh, you know, in general have been quite popular uh, in terms of trying to understand what is the, uh, correlation of the taxonomy with the physiology that you're studying. Um, in past few years, there has been some interest in looking into not only the DNA, that or DNA, or microbial DNA, but also looking at the microbial RNA and how that uh, might give you a lot more information, not only about the taxonomy, but also about the functions that are expressed. And again, here, um, I just wanted to mention that this is looking at the RNA expression of these uh, microbial uh, uh, samples. Uh, our lab for last 10 years has uh, focused on a method called metaproteomics. Uh, the difference between the earlier two methods is instead of looking at DNA or RNA samples, we look, look at the proteins that are expressed by these microorganisms. And uh, hence we get a much better understanding of not only the taxonomy, but also what are the functions that are uh, expressed um, by these, uh, by, by, by the microbiome in, in, uh, under investigation. Uh, and, and as you know, most, since most of the proteins uh, catalyze most of the functions, it's actually getting much closer to the function of the protein as compared to looking at, uh, of, of the microbiome as compared to uh, looking at the RNA that is expressed. We believe that when we do this, uh, we should be able to unravel the mechanistic details of microbial interactions, not only with the host, but also with the environment uh, by looking at what are the different proteins or functions or functional pathways that are expressed by the microbiome. So uh, the term metaproteomics was introduced way back in 2004, uh, almost 18 years ago. Um, and the, uh, the initial application was uh, to look at uh, simpler uh, ecosystems and try to find out uh, what are the organisms, uh, what are the proteins that are expressed by the organisms that are present in an environment. The focus has uh, very, uh, uh, very markedly shifted to now understanding the functions that are expressed by the uh, by, by the microbiome instead of looking at the taxonomy, and hence we we believe that it there is a definite uh, advantage that metaproteomics has in terms of uh, getting to understand uh, you know what what different functions that could be uh, expressed by the microbiome. So just to give a uh, hypothetical example, if you had a microbiome with these uh, two. Uh, uh, two, two micro, you know, microbiomes with, with similar taxonomy. Uh, and let's say if they were subjected to dissimilar conditions, in this case, uh, dissimilar nutrient, uh, nutrients that they're subjected to, uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it has been observed that you know, dissimilar proteins or functions that are expressed. And that is what we are measuring using metaproteomics and to some extent, metatranscriptomics as well. 
You could also have another example wherein you could start with a dissimilar taxonomy, uh, and then you could uh, subject these microorganisms to similar uh, conditions, and hence they might actually uh, express similar functions, although the, although the composition of taxonomy is entirely different. So uh, in both of these cases, metaproteomics is extremely useful, and we have um, we have started using the uh, using some of the bioinformatic workflows that we have um, that we have put in place. Uh, just wanted to mention, uh, way back almost ten years ago, there was a manuscript which had, um, in a way, uh, talked about why functions in microbiome are important. Um, and in this particular study, what researchers had done was that they actually collected samples from various body parts uh, from various geographical regions. So for example, uh, you would have uh, stool samples coming from various geographical regions. And here is shown uh, taxonomy. And as you can see in this stool sample, uh, there is a vast distribution of the genera uh, that are detected in these stool samples uh, if, you, if you take samples from various geographical locations. So there is no, um, there's not, not, you know, there, there's not much consistency in terms of uh, the taxonomic samples but when they took this data and um, and and used predicted functional uh, modeling to look at what are the uh, predicted functions that are expressed by these microorganisms uh, it was found that there is a lot more consistency uh, when we when when you're looking at the metabolic uh, functions or metabolic um, expression of these uh, of these bacteria uh, this kind of indicated and uh, i mean uh, that there is definitely uh, makes sense to look at functions rather than taxonomy of a particular microbiome because then you can set up a baseline and if you see any perturbations you should be able to detect that using functions as compared to looking at um, taxonomy so um, you know so you know just wanted to make a distinct distinction in terms of microbiome analysis and functional microbiome analysis wherein we are definitely interested in looking at the proteins that are expressed and hence the functions that are expressed by the microbiome um, and what I'll uh, talk next is about how we started working uh, and in, in the area of metaproteomics and how um, uh, try to tackle some of the difficulties uh, that were associated with metaproteomics. So uh, one of the few uh, few of the analytical challenges that are um, that one encounters with metaproteomics is that uh, in single organism uh, proteomics, for example, uh, the search databases are relatively small. Uh, there's a single organism, um, you know, and most of the proteins that you're going to detect are coming, going to come from that particular organism. While in metaproteomics, uh, the databases are usually very large because you are collecting samples or you, you kind of um, concatenating all the uh, proteomes from various um, taxonomic uh, members of these particular metaproteome. Uh, and then there are quite a few homologous proteins, uh, which kind of makes it challenging for you to detect um, find out which which organism does this particular peptide or protein come from. So uh, in order to take care of this, uh, there have been quite a few search algorithms that have been developed. Um, uh, and then uh, protein grouping uh, at, uh, has to be done at the multi-organism level instead of at a single organism level. Uh, the identification statistics do get affected by large databases. The larger the database, uh, the you know your uh, sensitivity of detection, both at the protein and peptide level, uh, diminishes. And then um, your taxonomy is based on unique peptide identifications, uh, while you can actually detect uh, functions uh, of, of proteins, even though these proteins have been shared by uh, multiple organisms. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So in order to kind of uh, handle these multiple problems or multiple tools that are required for this, we decided to use the Galaxy platform um, and uh, it basically helps you to put in multiple tools uh, and generate a workflow and hence uh, perform, uh, you know, kind of an end-to-end analysis uh, when you, wherein you can provide an input and you get an uh, output at the end of the workflow. So uh, I'll just very briefly uh, uh, give an overview of the methods that I use. So for example, if you generate a mass spectrometry data from your, uh, from your sample that you're studying, uh, you can use uh, a fastq file uh, either from your metagenomics or meta transcriptomics data and uh, get a, generate a protein fast file and then you match these uh, spectra against the protein fast file to detect your peptides um, and then again there are quite a few database generation methods that are available uh, we also have multiple database search uh, strategies available including some strategies that handle 
searches for larger databases. Um, and then once you identify these peptides, uh, either these peptides are unique to a particular taxon unit, it could be a genera, it could be a species, or it could be an order, uh, or they could be shared. And some of them might even be unassigned. So, you know, there are these um, quite a few categories of these uh, taxonomic analysis. But again, in our case, we would rely mostly on the ones that are detected as unique peptides to a particular taxon um, uh, level so that uh, we can confidently say that this particular organism or this particular genera or this particular uh, order was detected. On the functional level, um, you can assign these peptides to proteins. And then if these proteins have a function that is assigned, assigned to them, then you can kind of uh, perform functional analysis either by using pathway analysis or um, uh, using um, various tools that are available to kind of um, uh, to try, try to understand what, what are the different uh, gene ontology terms that these particular proteins uh, belong to. So based on this, um, we, uh, we developed a workflow, a very basic workflow to uh, enable researchers to put in their MGF files uh, or their uh, mass, spectrometry, mass spectrometry data. Um, then you search it against the protein FASTA file. Uh, when you search it, uh, and then there are uh, at least, I think two or three different search methods that we have right now, but uh, one of the most common ones that we use is a search query, which uh, basically uses two or three or even more search algorithms to uh, enhance the number of identifications that you have. And then you can uh, use uh, statistical methods uh, or protein grouping and FDR statistics to detect the number of PSMs, peptides, and proteins. So once you have that, uh, you can subject it to uh, unipeptide analysis, which performs both taxonomy as well as functional analysis, and that gives you, uh, you know, functional outputs, gene ontology outputs, as well as you can detect taxonomy. Uh, uh, with, you know, with either if you, if you would, if you are interested in looking at the genera that are detected, you can set that up, or you can also look at species or um, other taxonomic levels. So, uh, so there, you know, so this is one of the uh, basic metaproteomics workflow that we have available, and there's also a, a basic tutorial that's available in the Galaxy Training Network. Um, so, based on these, this workflow, and you know, modifications of this workflow, we have published quite a few papers. One of the first ones that we published was in 2012, and uh, this was uh, basically looking at uh, human salivary supernatant. So. Um, uh, one of the postdoctoral researchers in Griffin Lab had published a paper on human proteins that are present in uh, in in the uh, human saliva. And what uh, he had used was he had actually used a, a, an elaborate fractionation method to kind of expand the number of human proteins that are detected. And um, we decided to go back and uh, analyze this data and try to find out if there are any microorganisms present in that. And I think we ended up finding something like 123 uh you know uh, bacteria based on unique peptides that were assigned to them um, and this was something that we uh, published um, really early almost 10 years ago uh, later we uh, also looked at um, uh, one of the studies wherein uh, uh, professor joel Rennie from university of minnesota he was interested in looking at the effect of sucrose on uh, plaque dental microbiome and uh, find out whether there are certain uh, bacteria that are enrich enriched, but at the same time, were there certain proteins that were uh, differentially expressed in one case or the other? And I'll be talking a little bit about uh, this particular case study uh, while talking about one of the tools that we use to uh, analyze this data. Um, we also worked with uh, researchers at the University of Minnesota. Uh, 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 Professor Amy Skubitz had uh, data from the cervical vaginal microbiome, and again, as the, as with the salivary. Uh, Supernatant, they had initially analyzed it with uh, for human proteome, but later they decided to, uh, you know, we decided to go and look deeper into this data and we actually ended, uh, did find out uh, that there are quite a few bacteria that we could detect through the same data set. Um, and then we also worked with uh, Professor uh, Manish Bhargava uh, at the University of Minnesota to look at the bronchial alve alveolar lavage fluid. Um, so this is the fluid that's present in your lungs and can be a an indicator of the, you know, the health of, of the individual who's going through any, uh, uh, the health of the lung of the particular individual. Um, and then uh, just uh, last year, we published uh, a paper trying to, um, in, in the, right, right in the middle of pandemic, we're kind of interested to see if, apart from uh, SARS-CoV-2 peptides, 
in clinical samples, do we find any co-infecting bacteria that could be present in the samples? And we ended up, did end up finding a few of them. Um, and a few months later, there were quite a few uh, reports of secondary infections uh, occurring in various parts of the world, um, indicating that it is kind of important to study these uh, secondary infections uh, apart from, you know, the uh, finding out if there are um, indications of any um, COVID infection. So, um, you know, these were, these were all good in the sense this helped us to detect um, uh, some of the bacteria. Uh, they also helped us to detect some functions that have, some of the functions that have been expressed in these. Uh, but we were really interested in to, to look at how, how does the, uh, how do these proteins change? How do these functions change when they are subjected to different conditions? So for this, we started looking into uh, quantitative metaproteomics. And for most of you who have been doing mass spectrometry analysis, um, you might be aware that there are two different methods, uh, at least two methods that are used for uh, quantitation of mass spectrometry data. There are uh, labs which use spectral counts wherein they look at peptide spectral matches and try to uh, correlate that with you know the the expression of a protein. So let's say if you had a protein which was detected with um, two hundred uh, peptide spectral matches, or you know many number of uh, peptides as compared to in other condition which was where, where there are only ten, then you would kind of go back and try to calculate um, you know uh, whether there was any change, any differential expression. However, uh, there has been quite a few researchers who have started relying on looking at the intensity of the data, wherein you basically look at the uh, precursor mass uh, MS1 intensities and then try to uh, uh, correlate that with uh, the, you know, the abundance of that particular peptide and then you can uh, make a correlation. So we were very interested in looking at uh, these, um, you know, using these metrics so that we could uh, quantify taxonomy as well as functions. So, um, uh, you know, just to kind of, uh, highlight on that. There are quite a few different measurements that one can do. And again, as I mentioned earlier, metaproteomics is what we are interested in. Um, as you can, as uh, some of you who, who work in this uh, area of mass spectrometry will uh, uh, will definitely see here, there is a lot of uh, data here uh, and especially gets very complex, especially if you uh, were to look at the chromatogram of these uh, data sets and you'll see that um, you're not only looking at uh, spectra that are coming from a single organism, but from multiple organisms. So your complexity really goes up um, many fold. So um, while there are many taxonomic members of microorganisms that are known, there are some, still some undetected taxa. So there are going to be a lot of this spectra or a lot of this information is still untapped. Uh, there are quite a few uh, uh, proteins that have not been assigned any functions. So if you look at any uh, microbial proteome, you would find that 60% of the most 60% or maybe 50 to 60% of the genes are actually annotated based on homology or any experimental evidence. But there are uh, others like 40% or sometimes even more which are unassigned, uh, depending on how much that particular organism has been studied. So there is a need for quantitation of these, these, uh, these uh, taxonomic or even peptides or uh, functions. Um, uh, or proteins without any functions, just to understand how important these could be so that they could be characterized later. So uh, with that motivation, we uh, started working on a tool called MetaQuantum. Um, uh, one of uh, uh, students, uh, a very talented student, Caleb Easterly, he uh, had joined the lab um, and uh, we set out on using the peptides um, and their, uh, you know, the detection of the peptides, it's MS1 intensity, uh, the functional annotation that comes out from uh, uh, from some of the software, as well as taxonomic annotation, and you know, using this information, it could be kind of fed into um, this tool called MetaQuantum, and using uh, various R modules, it would generate these uh, various uh, outputs such as data explanation, differential abundance, or cluster analysis. So um, this manuscript was published three years ago in uh, Molecular and Cellular Proteomics, and what I'll show next uh, is uh, the use of this particular software so that, uh, so that we could use it for uh, not only this, but other data sets that we have been working on. Um, just to give a very um, brief overview, um, apart from the detection methods that I talked about earlier, and I'm, uh, let's, let's just focus on the top part here, uh, where, you, where you use search GUI peptide shaker, 
Uh, we also, uh, you know, use quantitation tools such as there is a tool called Flash LFQ that's, uh, uh, that comes from University of Wisconsin that we have installed in Galaxy. And once we have the outputs from that, that basically uh, goes into the uh, goes into this meta quantum tool, which has got multiple modules. Uh, and eventually, uh, after statistical analysis is done, you get these visualization outputs from meta quantum. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we proceed. So, uh, looking at this case study that I mentioned earlier, sucro sucrose induced oral dysbiosis. Um, there, this data set was uh, basically uh, the, this data set com came from uh, Professor Joel Redney's lab. Um, there was a mass spectral data was uh, acquired from plaque samples, uh, and these were basically uh, twelve children from which who had dental caries. Um, uh, the the plaques were collected from them, and then these were uh, either grown in presence of sucrose or in absence of sucrose. So they were basically grown in uh, bioreactors, and here is shown. Uh, the pH values of the bioreactors as they are grown um, and, and, and the points at which uh, sucrose was introduced in the sample. So the green line here basically shows the pH of, um, of uh, control samples and the red line shows uh, the pH of the, uh, or the average pH of the, um, of the uh, samples wherein sucrose was added. Uh, and as you can see here, sucrose is added at two points and then uh, samples were collected at uh, almost like 50 hour time point. Um, and then, so, you know, there were 12 pairs of samples, one with uh, as a control, another wherein sucrose was added. And um, we basically took this mass spectral data and searched it against a large database, uh, uh, used some reduced uh, database searching methods. And eventually the outputs that were generated were sent to MetaQuantum uh, for analysis. So this is what came out of meta quantum analysis. So if you look at the function, um, uh, if you look at the principal component analysis that came out of meta quantum analysis, you can see that the sucrose uh, samples shown here in red, um, as compared to the control samples shown here in blue, they kind of separated uh, from each other, right? But if you use taxonomy, uh, the separation was not as uh, not as good. Uh, at least if you look at the uh, the separation values that come out of this. And we have seen it not only for this data set, but other data sets such as uh, cellulose biodegradation data sets uh, and some other data sets that we worked on wherein if you um, if you subject a particular microbiome to conditions, uh, to a particular condition, and if you compare these, you see that when you use functional PCA plots, um, you see a lot more separation as compared to if you were to use taxonomy as a way to uh, separate these um, these outputs. Uh, what meta quantum analysis also does is uh, it also can tell you what are the differentially abundant taxa. It tells you what's the fold change uh, as compared to you know so this is sucrose as compared to uh, as compared to the control along with the uh, the uh, Q value that is associated, uh, kind of giving you an uh, idea about what is the uh, how much can you rely on this particular fold change. Uh, it also generates cluster heat map cluster analysis, and as you can see here. Uh, there is a separation of these two, except for these one uh, sample, uh, the, the blue being control and the uh, orange being uh, the uh, sucrose induced sample. Uh, one of the uh, advantages of using uh, meta quantum is that not only does it help you to understand what are the functions that are dif differentially expressed or protein uh, or uh, taxonomy that's uh, differentially expressed, but you also can ask questions such as if I'm interested in a particular uh, function, let's say carbohydrate metabolism. What are the different bacteria that contribute to this? So, for example, uh, you know, if you just look at the carbohydrate metabolism in control, what is the composition of taxonomy? What is the proportion of peptide intensity of the taxonomy that's present? And what is uh, and how, how does it differ if, and when you add, add sugar to it? And as you can see here, um, uh, Streptococcus is uh, the topmost uh, member here, while uh, that's not the case when you when you look at the control. Uh, and if you look at uh, Fusobacteriaceae, which is uh, present as a topmost member in, uh, in, in the control, it is, it, you know, in presence of sucrose, it's definitely not the case. So, um, and uh, there's an explanation for that. And we discussed this with uh, Professor Redney, who basically told us that uh, sucrose, uh, in presence of sucrose, there is lactate that is generated, which, uh, which uh, results in uh, increase in acidity, and hence as a Fusobacterium which does not uh, thrive in high 
uh, acidic conditions kind of falls down it in terms of its abundance and hence its ranking is uh, low down here while um, in control uh, the bacterium uh, it, the carbohydrates are utilized and these generate weaker acids and under low acidity fusobacterium thrives in mild acidic conditions and that's why you see this as the top mosaic. so there are these questions that can be addressed you can also ask a question such as if i have a particular taxonomic unit what are the you know what are the different functions that are expressed by the taxonomic unit in the, in the in two different conditions i won't be showing that example but that's something that metagontome helps you do uh, one other aspect that we are interested in so we talked about spectral counts and we uh, for metagontome we use uh, precursor intensities or uh, ms1 intensities um, but uh, we we were also interested in looking at uh, whether we can actually use data independent acquisition uh, in metaproteomics and see if there are any advantages using that. So just to kind of give a very quick precursor to uh, or uh, introduction to this uh, data dependent acquisition, uh, which is um, the method that is uh, that has been uh, in use for quite a few years to acquire data. It kind of uh, uh, targets uh, precursor ions and fragments them. Uh, and hence you kind of, uh, so here is shown uh, precursor ions uh, and as you can see here there is one small red one here which is a, a low a low abundant peptide while uh, these the green one is one of the higher abundance ones so if you uh, were subjected to uh, the dd analysis wherein um, uh, ms2 spectra are generated you end up getting these uh, spectra but as you can see here the red one is missing so low abundance peptides are kind of uh, some, most of the times, uh, low or medium abundance peptides are missed out when you're doing a DDA search or DDA acquisition. Well, if you were to use data independent acquisition, wherein you are, you, uh, you're not only focused on the uh, a particular uh, single precursor ion, but you're looking at a much larger uh, swath or much larger uh, area to acquire the data, um, you end up uh, basically acquiring this data and hence generate multiple MS2 spectra uh, and um, and you kind of do it in a sequential manner uh, and you end up generating a really complex uh, spectrum of sorts so there are uh, there are software that are used to uh, deconvolute this data and find out what are the proteins or peptides that have been detected here one of the advantages here is that you can kind of generate this uh, digital map of that particular proteome uh, and also end up detecting these uh, medium or uh, low abundance peptides in these samples and hence this seems to give a lot more reproducibility and also um, a lot more quantitative, um, uh, you know, it, it's a lot more amenable to quantitative analysis as compared to um, MS1 data. Analysis. So we wanted to kind of look at this um, and see if, you know, it, this indeed was case. So we, last year at ASMS, uh, we analyzed uh, and presented uh, two data sets. Uh, one was a bacteriophage infection data set and other one was a hydrothermal vent data set and based on these um, we found that if you were to if you were to compare the proteome coverage so these are basically peptides that are present in four replicates and you can see that uh, only 57.7 percent of peptides are present in all four of these samples while if you were to use dims methods uh, the coverage was much more impressive um, we also found that uh, there was a quantitative reproducibility uh, shown here are these four replicates that we analyzed for the bacteriophage samples. Um, there was a higher accuracy um, with uh, the DI method when you when you when you're looking at the biomass that's present in these samples. Uh, and then there were far less uh, missing values and a lot more uh, information that we got from DIMS analysis and far less missing values uh, in terms of proportion as compared to DDMS analysis. So we think that um, you know DIMS could be a method that can be used for metaproteomics as well. Uh, it has been successfully used for single organism proteomics, uh, and we worked with um, Sue Weintraub from uh, University of Texas and Brooke Nunn from uh, University of Washington, uh, who had generated this uh, data set so that we could analyze them. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, one of the, you know, kind of workflows that we have been developing. And this has been a result of, uh, you know, collaboration with uh, researchers um, who have expertise in various, you know, not only in sample preparation, data acquisition, uh, 
And then we, for this one, we actually used a method called as uh, the frames uh, uh, method, um, which helped us to go much deeper into the microbiome samples as compared to uh, if we were to do it on a, a normal mass spectrometer. So uh, just to kind of uh, give a, a, a very basic overview of this particular uh, project, um, we were interested in looking at uh, cystic fibrosis samples from, um, from, from children. Um, and we, uh, we basically, so we had, uh, you know, with our collaboration with, uh, uh, with researchers in Illinois, we had uh, quite a few samples from, um, uh, from, the, from the, both the groups. So shown here are CF samples and the L here stands for uh, samples with low uh, microbial diversity and H stands for those with higher microbial diversity. And DC are uh, samples from uh, deceased patients, but they did not have any uh, cystic fibrosis um, uh, uh, signs. So, so based on this, we basically had these uh, four kinds of samples. We generated a lot of data from the, you know, spectral data from this, uh, which was fractionated. And then we uh, match these data set against a really large 16S RNA guided uh, database. And that helped us to uh, generate a, a much smaller database. And we searched it with three different pipelines, uh, FRAC pipe, which comes from uh, University of uh, Developers in University of Michigan, MaxQuant, which comes from uh, Max Planck Institute in Martin Street in Germany, and SearchGuin Peptide Checker, which comes from Compromix, which is uh, based in Europe. So using these three uh, search algorithms, we identified proteins uh, and shown here in, um, in parentheses are, uh, are the microbial proteins or microbial peptides that were detected. So we ended up detecting uh, almost 2,300 uh, microbial peptides. Uh, and I kind of forgot to mention this, but whenever we are working on clinical samples, um, the, the most prominent proteins or peptides that are detected come from the host uh, human uh, sample. And hence, it is important for us to uh, detect microbial peptides. So, you know, the, the microbial peptide signal is um, it's, it's really a, of a very small proportion. And uh, using FAMES data and fractionation and using these um, uh, database reduction approach, we could uh, end up detecting quite a few peptides here that I've mentioned. Um, so once we had these microbial peptides that were detected using these three methods, we use a tool called, uh, called PepQuery, um, which is a really nice tool. And we have also implemented it in this galaxy wherein um, it can basically look at the evidence that uh, whatever peptide that you have detected, uh, there is enough evidence that this peptide um, uh, you know, there, there is enough spectral evidence that this peptide is not present in your reference sample. And uh, in this case, we were uh, comparing it with the human Unipro database. And uh, from the, out of the 2,292 micropeptides, we found 680 of these peptides uh, had a pretty good evidence that these were indeed present in the sample. So, um, you know, again, this is just the proportion of the number of peptides that were detected by each of these methods. And when we use PepQuery, um, which is uh, kind of agnostic to any search algorithm, it basically looks at the peptide and, and tries to find out the evidence for that, uh, that peptide being present in the sample. Uh, we ended up getting uh, much lesser, but you know, confident peptides that we got that were detected in either two or three samples, uh, three of these search algorithms. So um, you know, using this method of multiple search algorithms, PepQuery, and then eventually using uh, Unipep, which is used for taxonomy and functional analysis, we could kind of bring it down uh, to a list of um, verified microbial peptides, which is which still give us a pretty complex taxonomic tree. Uh, and this particular table, which was uh, generated by uh, Catherine Doe, who is a student here at the University of Minnesota, uh, we could find um, you know three different classes of pep uh, uh, of these peptides. And again, just wanted to mention these peptides had gone rigorous. Um, analysis to ensure that indeed these were present. There was good quantitation data available, and uh, these are confident peptides based on the uh, based on the search algorithms that we had used. Uh, there were quite a few peptides, almost 24 of them, which were which could be subjected to a particular taxonomy, which is which was interesting. Um, there were uh, some others which could not be assigned to a particular taxonomy, but they were still interesting because the, some of these actually uh, had some signatures which indicated they were. Uh, they, they could interact with host cells. So we are very interested in looking at some of these. There were some of these pe proteins, uh, pe uh, peptides coming from proteins, which were uh, ambiguous in its taxonomy. And when I, what I mean by that was, 
it was not very clear whether they actually came from microbial uh, uh, where they are of microbial origin or they had some uh, some properties that showed that indicated maybe that they were present from the host immune system so we are very interested in looking at these um, we also looked at the quantitation of these peptides and shown here is an example of one such peptide from pseudomonas wherein you can see that they were present uh, highly uh, were much more abundant in the cf samples as compared to the dc samples on the other hand we also found a few peptides that were detected um, in uh, only the DCH samples and nothing else. So we are very interested in going ahead and doing some targeted analysis on these and ensure that these uh, give us some uh, markers for not only detecting uh, you know, infection status of the particular individual that one is working on, but also maybe find out if there are any host peptides or proteins that, um, that are differentially expressed um, when, uh, when, when you are basically um, in fact, I mean, when you have uh, cystic fibrosis. So uh, the big plan, and we are still in working on this project, is uh, to have a panel of microbial peptides as well as human peptides so that uh, you could use them for targeted analysis uh, and hopefully help in uh, diagnosis of, um, of the state of the, you know, the, the state of the patient that, uh, that is under study so that uh, one can understand whether, uh, um, you know, cystic fibrosis, uh, it should be treated as a cystic fibrosis or should be treated uh, otherwise. Uh, and again, this work is um, led by Professor Tim Griffin, um, and we have been working on this um, along with uh, Monica Crook, who's uh, uh, one of the members of the, uh, who's the, one of the researchers at University of uh, Minnesota. Uh, lastly, with uh, the time that I have, I'd like to just uh, very quickly go through some of the education and promotion material uh, that we have been um, working on. So uh, metaproteomics has its uh, strengths, um, you know, as I've tried to um, uh, convey that, you know, it, it can uh, help you in, in finding out the functional composition of the microbiome. It helps you to understand the host microbiome interaction. It helps you to quantify biomass contributions. But again, there are there have been also problems in terms of uh, how do you extract a protein? How do you start with um, handling uh, false positives? Uh, how do you, you know, handle variability and abundance uh, issues that come out from microbiome uh, or functional microbiome analysis? So with this in mind, we were, uh, for last uh, five years now, we have been actually uh, holding quite a few tutorials, both in person as well as online, uh, to introduce metaproteomics to new researchers, uh, we also hope that this will make tools and workflows accessible to researchers and uh, hopefully attract new uh, talents uh, and perspectives. And this is kind of uh, in line with some of the other tutorials that some of you might have attended. There's a Skyline tutorial. There's a, you know, there are uh, summer tutorials in MaxQuant uh, Max uh, conducts. And uh, I think Transproteomic Pipeline also has some uh, workshops. So uh, we hope that we'll have regular metaproteomics uh, workshops as well. Um, as I mentioned, for last five years, we have uh, presented workshops at various venues. Um, and if you if you are interested in look at looking at some of these, uh, you can go to this link here uh, and uh, get more information as well as material that's available uh, from these workshops. You can also contact us if you are interested in um, any of this uh, material. So I just very quickly wanted to take you through one of the uh, workshops that we held in uh, in India in uh, last fall. And um, this was, um, and again, there are these links here, uh, which you can go to and uh, know more about it. Uh, but just to give you an overview, this particular workshop was a week long workshop. Uh, and in the morning, uh, there used to be talks by uh, eminent researchers from all across the world. This was, you know, since it was online, we could, uh, we could invite researchers from Europe, Australia, US, uh, you know, at, at the right time so that uh, students can hear it. Uh, then and then we uh, introduced the researchers or uh, students to training material, uh, and then these this training material were basically videos of step by step instructions so that researchers can you know could could run these on their own, and then the participants ran these workflows based on these instructions, uh, and then in the evening there was a Q and A session, and the next morning we used to have quiz sessions so that we could test how well uh, the students had followed this. Uh, we did this um, for. Introduction to Galaxy, Metagenomics, Metatranscriptomics, and Metaproteomics, and we also collected uh, their feedback, which is kind of captured here in word clouds that have been shown here. Uh, we also collected feedback based on um, 
you know what they thought about the quality of talks satisfied with the workshops and as you can see there was uh, you know it was a really fulfilling experience because um, not only did we enjoy the experience of teaching multiple researchers about this but also uh, i think they enjoyed a lot as you can see with these reactions that we got from them into almost 80% or more of them were very happy with uh, various features of this workshop um so just to kind of come to a conclusion we work very closely with the galaxy training network and again uh, for any of this information you can go to any of these uh, links to get um, not only uh, step by step instructions but also video tutorials and also access to some of the public servers that you can access these along with the input data if you want to learn about the tools that i mentioned here uh, we also work with very closely with the metaproteomics initiative which is a european um, uh, proteomics uh, association uh, funded um, uh, metaproteomics society but is uh, you know it covers uh, all of the world and uh, we definitely um, i am an active member of of that particular community and uh, we are definitely looking forward uh, if pe people are interested they should definitely join in uh, if they want to either participate or learn more about metaproteomics um, well, the long-term goal is to have all of these tools available so that eventually uh, that leads to your biological discovery, either through online training or um, uh, workflows that are accessible uh, through various um, public Galaxy servers. Uh, and again, if you want, if you're interested in any of these tools, they're available on this uh, either in the Galaxy Toolshed or on the Galaxy train, Training Network. And at, at you know, if if you don't find anything there, or if you find something interest, if you if you are interested in collaborating with us or even have any questions about any of the workflows, you can also contact us um, on this link. Um, I'll maybe just skip this because I think I've covered most of this. I've talked about DD and DI analysis and quantitation, but we are very interested in working uh, in this area. We are also very, very interested in uh, using targeted metaproteomics to validate the proteins or peptides or functions that uh, that we have uh, detected in our discovery workflows. And we are also interested in looking at uh, how quantitation can help us to find uh, more information about unknown uh, proteins of unknown function. Um, with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge some of the researchers, uh, uh, Professor Tim, uh, Tim Griffin, who is um, uh, who's the PI on the Galaxy uh, P grant? Uh, he is uh, uh, Galaxy P project. He is um, he's helped us guide through all of this. Um, we also have quite a few researchers, um, including Subina Mehta, uh, Monica Crook, uh, and Catherine Doe, who have con contributed to this, to this particular project. Um, and we have worked with multiple researchers uh, across the world, either as you know data analysts, users, or even developers who have developed various tools. Um, we work very closely with the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute. Uh, James Johnson and Reed Wagner help us to put in new tools or even update any tools um, so that they're kind of uh, kept relevant for any of the new workflows that we work in. Um, again, we at various points of this project, we are funded by NSF, NIH, uh, and also uh, the Norwegian Centennial uh, Chair. Um, and um, you know, if, if you're interested, you can uh, go to this website to mo know more about Galaxy P, uh, or you can follow us on uh, Twitter if you're interested to know more about, um, about the latest manuscripts or work that we have been doing. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Pratik. Anybody have any questions? I was wondering, Pratik, if you could just give uh, a minute or two overview of how somebody that might want to start using Galaxy P, uh, what that process looks like. Right. So, uh, you know, we, whenever a new user, uh, either at the university or from outside the university, has come to us, we have uh, most of the times directed them to. I mean, so, you know, we we basically have a conversation with them in times in terms of understanding what the project is about. Um, and then we direct them to the right uh, tutorials that are available on Galaxy Training Network. Um, the Galaxy Europe resource or the Galaxy Europe web server is a pretty good resource wherein most of our workflows and tools uh, are available. And uh, it has a, a, a you know, decent amount of memory or uh, storage that one can use to you know, perform uh, 
project analysis. So we, we that's what we have been doing uh, within the university. Sometimes we, most of the times we do it on uh, the local server uh, at the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute. Um, and again, as um, issues come up or if there are any new um, outputs that uh, a researcher would like to be interested in, we definitely are in touch with them and uh, and help them out. So um, definitely a conversation followed by, you know, directing them to uh, the right resources and then uh, helping them as, as the workflows are run. I mean, our, our goal is mostly to ensure that most of the times the researchers are the ones who analyze the data, um, you know, uh, but uh, there could be times wherein we could actually help them to uh, add some new modules to this uh, to this analysis as well. Um, yeah. I, I have a question, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so you you were mentioning, at least with one of your uh, metaproteome ex experiments, having maybe a little bit of difficulty discerning between bacterial um, proteins versus eukaryotic host proteins. Um, that's actually something I've been kind of considering in some, uh, you know, experiments or how to even kind of tackle that potential issue. Do you have any recommendations or are you working on, um, or I guess any recommendations for kind of teasing that apart when it's not possible to get a super clean, you know, say bacterial population or host population and subtract out the contribution potentially of the bacterial proteome? Yeah, I mean, um, most of the time we rely on uh, this tool called Unipep to kind of give us a, a pretty good indication about, you know, whether it's of bacterial origin or of a host origin, right? But um, in this particular case, the, you know, the 20 pro peptides that I showed you were actually, um, it's, it's quite interesting because uh, some of these peptides seem to be um, either associated with uh, the, the variable portion of, uh, of, the, uh, of the immune system, uh, or you know, if you if you go down the list when when you're doing the blast p analysis, you can sometimes see bacteria present there as well. Uh, obviously, in our case, we started you know the protein FASTA file that we started with was for, of bacterial origin, so we tend to believe that these are from bacterial uh, origin. But what interest uh, inter interested us most was that there was a you know a differential expression when we're comparing it with CF and DC samples, the DCs as well as the cystic fibrosis sample. So for us. Um, even if it is of host origin, uh, I think this could still be very interesting, uh, you know, biomarkers if, if we, you know, if they end up being seen in the targeted analysis as well. Um, but, you know, if we, have, if, we, if we come through such, a, you know, such a, uh, such, such, you know, in, in such cases, what we basically do is um, we then start using other tools such as BLASTP or, um, Megan and other tools, you know, basically put it to put it through orthogonal analysis to ensure that um, we kind of try to find out whether which which particular um, whether it comes from bacteria or host. Um, uh, but in most cases, uh, we actually do not uh, see that as a problem. Uh, but you know, this was kind of a unique situation wherein we found that they are differentially expressed, and uh, looks like they came from this uh, uh, immune system. Uh, wherein there is a lot of variable regions and hence, you know, uh, but, but, you know, that, that's something we will kind of keep uh, working on. So um, our suggestion is to, you know, either use multiple algorithms to find out more about it or design experiments or follow-up experiments wherein you can um, find out whether they're indeed of host origin or bacterial origin. Um, I see, yeah, thank so, you, yeah. Other questions? Pratik, I, I was wondering if you would uh, comment, there's a lot of different data acquisition methods out there and it seems like you've been through data analysis workflows on many of them. Uh, do you have any consensus on what the right combination of DDA, FAMES, DIA is at this point for maximizing coverage and or quantitation? of metaproteome samples? So uh, most of our data analysis has been on the DDA samples because you know that's what you know was available earlier. Uh, FAMES and DI have uh, you know have just started 
becoming more accessible now and the initial data that we have got uh, seems to be very promising i mean um, it could be possible three years from now if you were to do quantitation and if you have a choice uh, you know dia could be the choice because it really gives a really nice um, you know, very less missing values, good quantitative reprodu reproducibility and, you know, depth of coverage and all of that. But uh, we would like to use it on at least two or three data sets and ensure that, mm -hmm. and we're actually doing, you know, one more experiment right now wherein we are looking at a, a, a mock microbial community wherein we know the, um, the, the amounts of bacteria that are present and we would like to see how well DDA does as compared to, or how well DI does as compared to DDA, as compared to the, you know, the known uh, amounts of the sample. So uh, once we have some information there and maybe after doing some more functional analysis studies, um, that could be the way to go. Um, we haven't really used much of FAMES data, except that it really helps us to get deeper into the sample in the sense that's one data that we have used that, that I showed just now. Uh, there's also opportunity to look at iron mobility data sets, but we haven't handled those. Um, so uh, there's a lot that can be done. It's just that, um, you know, we'd like to test these before we can confidently say, yes, yep. that's the way to go if you really have an access to these instruments yep. or acquisition. Makes, makes sense. Yep. Any other follow-up questions from the audience? Well, thank you again, Pratik. Um, I did see somebody just come off mute. See who it was. Oh, that was me. <laughs> okay. Kitty, any questions? Uh, I don't have any specific questions now. Um, I look forward to interacting with you at ASMS. Definitely. Yeah. I have a little so, bit of uh, FAMES data looking at uh, some microbiomes of known composition. So. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, looking forward to meeting in Minneapolis at ASMS. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Pratik. That was great. Yeah. Thanks very much. Have a good day. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye.